I'm Jerry Friedman. I became vegan approximately 1992. When I was a child, I had a strong affinity for animals. I had rabbits, I had rats, I had snakes, and I just loved animals. And I decided by the age of 10 that I would become a veterinarian. And when I was, when I was 10, I actually thought about a nuclear war, a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And I actually was thinking like we would not need accountants to rebuild society after, after a nuclear war. We would need veterinarians, and I loved animals. So I followed that path all the way to college. I went to undergraduate college at New Mexico State University. I was enrolled in their pre-veterinary program. And the very first class that I took, the very first semester, very first day was called Animal Science 101. And Animal Science 101 taught about, the, it was more of marketing of animals for food. It taught us the cuts of meat, the various cuts of the, of the cow, the prime, etc. It taught us about the uh, antibiotics that were given to the cows and the growth hormones and so forth. I had two bad experiences there, two bad experiences that I specifically remember. In one of them, the professor brought in the uterus of a slaughtered cow and opened up the uterus. And inside the uterus was a fetus, a calf fetus, about the size of a football. And I remember thinking that why couldn't they have waited for the baby to be born and then slaughtered the cow. Why did they have to slaughter the cow and, and kill the baby at the same time? There was another instance where the professor wanted us to get a sperm sample from a ram. And the way they do that is they chased, the students chased this ram into a metal contraption that grabbed the ram on his sides and rotated him onto his side. And they took a device that's called an anal electro ejaculator and stuck that up the ram's anus which then had an electrical current which forced an orgasm and the students caught that ejaculate in a, in a vial. And when they were doing this, I was standing about 10 or 15 feet back thinking this is rape. I had so many problems with the curriculum that I asked the professor once if I could present to the class, if I could give a speech to the class about why some people chose to be a vegetarian and I wasn't even vegetarian yet but I was, I was wrestling with the material. I, I, wanted to go to, I wanted to become a veterinarian to help to learn how to make animals healthy, but they were teaching me how to make them healthy enough for slaughter. And I was just having, I was having so many emotional upheavals about what I was learning. Of course, the professor said no. He didn't want me to talk to the class about why some people became a vegetarian. I did not show up to the final exam, so I failed the class. And uh, I was told later that if I wanted to become a veterinarian, I had to take the class again, get at least a C. I took the class again, I got the C, and another semester or two after that, I just dropped out. I couldn't, I could not continue with that program. So you had to endure all that over again just to get a C? Yeah, I went through the class a second time and to, to get the C grade. So I dropped out, I moved back to California, my home, and just randomly, I went to UC Irvine. They had something called a Waz Goose Fair. And the Waz Goose Fair is like a low budget Renaissance fair. And at the Waz Goose Fair, there was a table with people from Orange County People for, for Animals, OCPA. And I started talking with these people at the OCPA table. And everything they were talking about animal rights, everything they were talking about veganism resonated with me. I took their literature, I read their literature, over probably six months and I started volunteering with them. I met some of the members, I met a lot of the members, and these people that I met, they were happy, they were healthy, they were energetic, they loved fighting for the rights of animals, and they were vegan. So when I met these people, these vegans, and I saw that you could be vegan, you could be happy and healthy and vegan, I changed my diet and by age 24, I figure, by age 24, I became vegan myself. Wow. And that was 1992? 1992, wow. approximately. Wow. That's quite a while. So it's probably something, I guess, you don't recall maybe how that might have affected you physiologically because it's been a while. Did, that cha did, it, did you change physiologically at all that you recall? I don't remember any differences at all. I mean, and I would have... I would have remembered if something had happened. Uh, I would have realized that there were all these happy, healthy vegans, but I'm not. 
And all I did, I didn't change my diet very much. I used to have chicken chow mein, so I had vegetable chow mein. I used to have pizza with cheese, so I had pizza without cheese. And so the, the change I made to my diet was very subtle. Uh, it was just consistent. Mm -hmm. And then I learned more about vegan food that I never would have thought of before. Like uh, Ethiopian food has wonderful vegan options. Some of the tastiest food on the planet are these vegetarian, vegan, Ethiopian food. I never would have had that if I was eating animals at the time. It wasn't on the animal part of the menu. And so after I became vegan, looked at the vegan part of the menu, and, I've, and I was introduced to Ethiopian food. In 1992, becoming vegan, I mean, was it just basically overnight that you did this and you just instantly? So, uh, no, uh, I did not become vegan overnight. Mm -hmm. When I met these, when I met these other vegans, I was already not eating mammals. I was not eating cows. I was not eating pigs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had very little dairy. I had very little milk, very little cheese. Um, and that was from a, a previous doctor who said that these things, that we just shouldn't be eating these things. But I stopped eating uh, mammals. I stopped eating milk because of what the doctor said, not for ethical reasons. Mm -hmm. And so by the time that I met these other vegans, that's when that was the, the last push, so to speak. And I think from that point that I met them, it was probably around six months to a year that I felt comfortable becoming vegan. I just, before I met these people, I'd never met vegans before. I didn't even know what the word was. And, you know, everybody else, as, as people today can relate, everybody else in my life ate animals. And it was, it was strange, it was alien, it was unusual. And so I had a slow walk of maybe six months to a year between not eating cows and pigs to uh, being full vegan. Now, this was in California, right? Correct. I guess it might have been a little easier to do out there, or was it pretty hard? I mean, this is a while back. I don't know that it was any easier or any harder than any place else. There was certainly no vegan economy. I do remember by my high school, there was a health food store. And when I would walk home from high school, I would go to this health food store and I would eat a turkey burger, for example. So even though they called themselves a health food store, it's not health food by what we would think of today. And one of my funny memories from there is I remember there was a guy there that had a t-shirt that said soy power on it. And I remember thinking like, that guy's ridiculous. Who would wear a t-shirt with soy power? And then of course I became that guy. I'm that guy now. So that's a question I like to ask people before going vegan. Did you ever think there's no way I could do that? I don't think that I ever thought there is no way I could do that. I think that what I remember 30 years back, I remember thinking that I would be a vegan who would still eat cheese. Maybe I'll just eat cheese. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking, I remember the second to the last time I ate meat, which was uh, chicken. I remember the second to the last time and thinking, I wonder if this is the last time I'll eat meat. And then another week went by and I had uh, more chicken. I wonder if this is the last time I'll eat meat. And that second time was the last time. Nice. You ever crave it? I don't crave, I have never craved, I have never craved meat. I have craved cheese sometimes. Uh, but even nowadays, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of alternatives for that craving, mm -hmm. but I've never acted on that craving. I've never acted on the craving to eat uh, animal cheese, uh, but I'll have, uh, vegan cheese on pizza sometimes. There wasn't, when I became vegan, there was no vegan market. There was no vegan cheese. There was no vegan milk available. Soy milk was made, of course, soy milk goes way back in history, but you couldn't go to the grocery store and get soy milk. It just, it wasn't available. Uh, and so I, uh, there wasn't vegan butter. And so I just stopped eating those and I lost the taste for it. And only in the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years that, that these products have been brought to market, have I somewhat slowly introduced some of the food back to my diet, but it's, I, I just don't, it's not part of my diet anymore. It's not, it's not food. Mm -hmm. So I remember when uh, Tofuti Cuties came out, which were ice cream sandwiches. I used to love ice cream sandwiches. And when Tofuti Cuties came out, I ate so many of them, but. I've never even heard of those. Tofuti Cuties, yep. They are these small ice cream sandwiches. I, I mean, I've, I've never eaten 30, but I imagine I could eat 30 at a, at a session. It's just, they were just that good. So wow. 
And I remember back when I was becoming vegan as well, I, would, I wouldn't drink milk because I didn't have soy milk or oat milk or any of these milks. So when I would eat cereal, I would put apple juice on my cereal, Whoa. which does not taste good. Cereal is not designed for apple juice, but this is what we did back in the day. And I just removed the animal products from it. So have you had any kind of challenges along the way? Actually, I've had the reverse. Mm -hmm. So when I was around 27, so I would have been vegan for around three years, I still felt like a new vegan. I had an inguinal hernia, which is a hernia, hernia on the lower right abdomen. Um, a lot of men get it. And I had to be scheduled for surgery. This is, I'd never had surgery before. And I remember thinking that maybe because I'm gonna have surgery, maybe I should start eating fishes for the protein. Mm -hmm. And I remembered, I remembered this dilemma very well. And I ultimately decided not, not to eat any fishes. I had the surgery. I saw the surgeon two weeks later for a checkup. The first thing he saw, the first thing he said when he saw my incision is you heal well. And when he said that, that for me was complete validation that I didn't eat fishes and that the vegan diet, I just went through major surgery and I heal well. You're predominantly vegan for ethical reasons, right? Correct. Like almost entirely, right? Correct. So if a doctor said you, you really should be eating fish or something like that, how would you respond? I would get another doctor. <laughs> all right, all right. Now let's, let's talk about the ethics. How has that evolved over the years? Veterinary school, pre-veterinary school, put me into this emotional quandary that I wanted to help animals be healthy and I didn't want to be part of the institutionalized cruelty, the, the slaughterhouse industry. I didn't want to be part of that. The school I went to was a veterinary school that specialized in what they call large animal, which would be cows and pigs and so forth. And so I didn't have these wonderful arguments and I hadn't talked to any philosophers or I hadn't talked to any doctors who said that veganism was the right way to go. It was just as, as plain as, as anyone should be able to see that if we can survive well without violence, then we should survive well without violence. It, it doesn't get any deeper than that. It doesn't need to get any deeper than that. But since that time, I have become very well versed in the, the science of evolution and how the human body uh, evolved to eat plants. Uh, I'm very well versed in a lot of the philosophies over uh, over the centuries, you can go all the way back to ancient Egypt and the ancient, Egypt, the ancient Egyptians were vegetarian uh, into Pythagoras and into uh, a lot of the Greek philosophers. You can go into the Middle East and there's a strong component of uh, either veganism or vegetarianism. And I say either one because uh, vegan itself, that term wasn't really shaped yet. And so it's a little unclear if some of the vegetarians back then were vegan or not. It's, it's possible. For example, Apollonius of Tyana lived around the time of Jesus Christ, and he was an ethical vegan. He was hardcore ethical vegan. So there was veganism back then. Uh, and then how that veganism uh, was persecuted in Europe, the Romans persecuted it, but it maintained and people started calling it the Pythagorean diet. There were different groups of Christians at the time, like the Cathars in southern France, who were ethical vegans. All of these groups, veganism maintained, it got into England. There was uh, a Reverend William Cowherd, who was the first Christian who articulated veganism for ethical reasons. Uh, in Christianity, he was the first Christian to say that was, it was part of Christianity not to eat animals. Uh, and then it came over to the United States. Uh, I'm, so I'm very well versed in the history of it. And I tell you, for being, being vegan for 30 years, I get questions from, I get silly questions like if there was a spaceship that landed and the aliens came out and they were shaped like carrots and they said, stop eating our carrot brothers, what would I do? So I get these silly questions and then I get the not so silly questions, you know, aren't we designed to eat meat? Um, why do you believe that animals feel pain? And these other questions that a lot of people ask that even now for me, it seems kind of obvious, mm -hmm. but I've been thinking about these things. I've been researching these things for 30 years, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with them. What's, a, what's something that's been the most challenging to debunk? The only argument against veganism that is difficult to debunk 
is why should we care? But that is not a question that's unique to veganism. Why should we care about the Ukrainians? Why should we care about um, Hong Kong? Why should we care about anything? And the, the reason why it's hard to debunk is because it goes to the core of what a lot of people will call tribalism. People will think that they care about themselves, they think about their family, they care about their family, they care about their community, maybe they care about their country. And as you get farther and farther away from the individual, it is harder and harder to convince people that somebody who is suffering here in the United States, somebody who is suffering in India or Australia, the moral wrong is the same. It doesn't matter where they're located. It's still wrong. And so in the same way that it gets harder and harder to convince people the farther they are away from family, it, it, the same thing goes with species. A lot of people think it's terrible to be cruel to dogs and cats, but it's not terrible to be cruel to, to cows. Or maybe it's terrible, terrible to be cruel to dogs, cats and cows, but not to chickens or maybe not to fish, and so on and so forth. And so as we keep on extending this to farther and farther species, why should we care is the hardest thing to convince people. You got your poster over there. Yeah. Talk about that real quick. Sure. This uh, poster was an advertisement for a talk, for a lecture mm -hmm. that I participated in. I was actually the plaintiff of a lawsuit against Kaiser Permanente Hospital. Kaiser Permanente is the largest nonprofit hospital in the United States. And at the time, I worked with them as a computer technician. They offered me a permanent position on the condition that I would take the MMS vaccine, which is mumps, measles, and chickenpox. And uh, I refused. I refused on ethical grounds because that vaccine is actually cultured in a fertilized chicken egg. So there is a developing baby chicken inside of the egg, and they inject it with the viruses, and they wait for the, the chick's body to give an immune response, and then they pull that immune response out, and then they give that to people as part of the vaccine. So I refused on ethical grounds. Uh, let me emphasize, I have no problem with the science of vaccines. I support the science of vaccines. I just don't want chickens or other animals to suffer for it. So there are some vaccines that they use that they develop with chimpanzees, for example. No problem with the vaccine. I don't want them to use chimpanzees. So Kaiser Permanente fired me, and I probably called 15 or so lawyers, and Scott Meyer was the lawyer who took my case. So we had this lawsuit against Kaiser Permanente, and somebody at UCLA School of Law learned about it, and they invited us to be speakers, and so we talked about the case. Scott talked about the law of the case, and I, sp I talked about my experience with the case. California employment law protects people with an ethical position. If a company has a policy and your ethical position conflicts with that policy, then the, the employer is required by law to try to accommodate your ethical position. They don't have to accommodate it, they have to try. If they try and they fail, then they can fire you. If they try and succeed, then terrific. But if they don't try at all, there's a lawsuit. And so in this case, Kaiser Permanente gave no effort to try to accommodate my ethical objection to taking the vaccine. So for example, I worked on computers. At the, at working on the computers, I worked actually in a pharmaceutical warehouse. And so there were no patients. Uh, and so one of the ways that they could accommodate is to require me to stay at the pharmaceutical warehouse, which is the only place I worked at anyway, and say, Mr. Friedman, you just can't go to one of the hospitals. Because at the same time, they would have other vendors go to the hospitals that they didn't screen. They would have UPS delivery people go there. They would have you know, vendors who stock the vending machine or stock the kitchen or whatever it is. And these other companies, these employees of other companies, they didn't have to be tested for these diseases. They didn't have to be certified. And so my lawyer and I, our rationale was, why not just keep me out of the hospital setting if actually, af after all, the hospital lets other people in? So the, the point of the lawsuit and the point of the law was that they didn't even try to say, Mr. Friedman, we understand you have this ethical objection. 
let's try to figure something out. And then if we can't figure it out, then okay, we'll fire you. But if we can't figure it out, we really value the, the work you do here. We'd like you to keep working with us. Wow. So you won. We won in theory. <laughs> we did not win. <laughs> so the, I told you that the law says uh, if you have a conflict with your ethical uh, position, the, what the law actually says, and I'm glad you followed up with that, what the law actually says is that if you have a religious opposition to a policy, then you can make a religious, uh, like a religious exemption. Now the case law in California, and actually in the United States, a religion is very loosely defined. They say it could be a creed, it could be an organized religion, it could be an unorganized religion. It is, it is a ethical position is what it comes down to. And the best case, there's actually two cases, the best two cases that demonstrate that is that during the Vietnam War, there were two atheists, these were two separate lawsuits, two atheists, both who did not want to take a gun and start shooting people in, in Vietnam. Uh, one of them was raised by Quakers, and Quakers are a group of Christians who are absolutely opposed to violence. And so one of these atheists was raised by Quakers and he had this absolute opposition to violence. And the other atheist, I don't remember what his grounding was, but he, didn't want to, he wanted to be a conscientious objector as well. And so when their cases went to court, because the armies wanted them to grab a gun and shoot, when their cases went to court, the United States Supreme Court said that you do not need a traditional religion to claim this ethical exemption. It is good enough that they have a sincere belief that there is a morality that they have to follow in order not to kill people. And so it's really the sincerity of the belief that's tested. And as you'll hear throughout this interview, I'm extremely sincere ethical vegan. I extremely do not want to take any vaccine that's derived from animals. And that sincerity is enough to trigger the law that protects California employees. It just so happened that we lost at the trial level. We had a, a hearing to dismiss the case and we, then the case was dismissed. We appealed it one step, which is normal. You get one free appeal. And the Court of Appeal disagreed. The Court of Appeal said that in order for you to have a religion, you have to have, the word they used was otherworldliness. There has to be an otherworldliness about your religion. And they said there's no otherworldliness about veganism and therefore they kicked the case out. We appealed that again, and the California Supreme Court decided not to hear the case, so that appellate decision held. Now, if that case was brought again, it should win. The idea is solid. The idea is solid that it is the sincerity of the belief that matters, and not that you have a clergy, not that you have holidays on the calendar, not that you go through whatever rituals. How can they have these vaccinations without these animals in the mix? The way that vaccines were originally developed was to co-opt or commandeer the animal's immune system. So, I mean, this goes way back. What happened with the very first vaccines is that they had these dead human bodies. They died of uh, cowpox, I believe. And these corpses would uh, would dry, the skin would dry, and some of the people who were exposed to the dry skin of these dead people, they found that these people were not coming down with cowpox. And it was through this, uh, a long series of discoveries that by taking diseased material from another animal, from a human or a non-human animal, and putting that diseased material in very small amounts into our own bodies gives our body a kickstart. And that's the whole idea of vaccines. So that's the way vaccines have been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now there are starting, they are starting to find other methods of vaccines that do not involve animals. So for example, there is a pill called Tamiflu. Tamiflu is entirely developed by plants. It is a vegan vaccine, which helps guard against the flu. And I, I, I don't know the, the, the methodology of the medication, but I can tell you that it's vegan, I've checked it. Uh, with the COVID-19 vaccinations, both Pfizer and Moderna uh, do not use animal ingredients in their vaccines. And so I got the Pfizer vaccine. The chimpanzee vaccine that I'm aware of, I believe is the polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. And polio vaccines are not being used 
presently. I would imagine if the polio vaccine came back, they would probably use chimpanzees again, and there'd be a lot of people protesting against that. And hopefully they would find something to use besides chimpanzees. In what ways have you been an activist throughout your 30 years? Throughout my 30 years. So when I started participating with Orange County People for Animals, I was, I would say, just like anybody else, this was an entirely new world to me. And the way that I got involved with them at the very beginning, this was long before the internet, they would have lists of their own volunteers, they would have lists of other people in the community. We would stuff envelopes with requests for donations. The organization needed money. So me and friends, me and other people there at OCPA, we would have like three hour nights, uh, I don't know, from seven o'clock to 10 o'clock or whatever, and we would be stuffing envelopes uh, putting address labels on, putting stamps on, and sending them out. And that was my very beginning introduction to the organization. As I became more comfortable with this whole new idea of veganism, they had some demonstrations. They would have protests. I remember there was one person in the community. I remember her last name was Slaughter, which is a hard name to forget. I think her first name was Paula. So I believe there was a Paula Slaughter in that in our community, in, our, in the county, who had been caught stealing dogs out of people's yards and selling them to vivisectors for, mo for money, of course. And so I remember we went to a protest at her house. We were on the sidewalk and we were protesting against what she was doing. So uh, we got press coverage for that. And I, I believe, as far as I know, I believe that she stopped. She was exposed and she didn't do it anymore. Somewhere in the middle of that, I remember being asked for the first time if I would, part, would be, would, if I would be willing to participate in civil disobedience. I did not know what civil disobedience was, but pretty much any time that the, uh, the president of the organization, her name is Ava Park, pretty much any time Ava Park, she asked me to do something, I, I would do it. And so what ended up happening was the organization, Orange County People for Animals, we had a ongoing campaign against Knott's Berry Farm. Knott's Berry Farm is like a, a miniature Disneyland in Orange County. And Knott's Berry Farm had a large, uh, they had a large water tank where they had some dolphin shows. We had the Northridge earthquake, if I recall, in 1991. And after that earthquake, a couple of the dolphins died. After the dolphins died, the... Orange County People for Animals hired a marine biologist to go and study what was going on with that dolphin tank. Why did these dolphins die? And the marine biologist came back and the biologist said that, you know, there's roller coasters on one side of a walkway, then there's a walkway, there's the dolphin tanks and the noise goes through underground. And so these dolphins have this constant noise that they can't escape. Uh, the biologist said that the water was chlorinated, which makes it safe for humans, but it's unsafe for dolphins. The biologist said that there wasn't any shade from the sun, and so she just had this checklist of this problem, this problem, this problem with the dolphins, and that's why the dolphins died. So we had a campaign against Knott's Berry Farm, and at some point, Ava decided to escalate. And the escalation was having people, several of us volunteers, to uh, participate in civil disobedience. So that day that we decided, I remember it was a hot day, and I had a heavy jacket on and I was thinking like, I know I'm going to be discovered. I know I'm going to be discovered. Why is somebody wearing a heavy jacket on a hot day? And on my wrist, I had essentially, I had a handcuff. One of my wrists was handcuffed. It wasn't, it was, it was a chain with a padlock, but it's essentially a handcuff. And so we went into the dolphin show for the, for the program. They had, you know, all, all sorts of people just piling in there to see the dolphin show. And I remember my heart was pounding and pounding. I sat in the front row center stage, and a few seconds after the show started, I walked up and I went to the railing, and I remember a security guard was walking toward me, and I, I had thrown my jacket off, and I wrapped the, uh, the other chain, the, the other part of the handcuff around the railing, and I locked it. And the security guard so politely said, you can't do that. And I just remember thinking, like, what am I gonna do? Like, I'm just gonna say okay and walk away. But anyway, all these memories from way back when. So I was facing the dolphin tank and I just turned around and I started 
chanting. I started saying, close the dolphin tank, and like, this is, this is cruel. I don't remember what I said so many years ago, but I was just chanting to the crowd. So when I did that, two other volunteers on the right side of the tank and two other volunteers on the left side of the tank did the same thing. So there were five of us who, was, who were chained to the dolphin tank. And then we had a couple of people walking through the uh, bleachers handing out literature. We had a, a photographer. And there was also a protest outside. And so a few minutes after we started doing that, they made the announcement at the dolphin show that they were shutting the show down just for that, that one show. They had everybody go out. And as people were walking out, I had a lot of conversations. A lot of people would stop and they asked me what I'm doing. Uh, so all the people piled out. So that was, one, that was one show that we closed and then a second show closed. And then police came and asked us to leave and we all refused to leave. And so they arrested us. They, um, I mean, the, the chain that I, I wrapped around was a, like a fake, uh, it was a fake lock. There was a, a link that could just be unscrewed. And so the cops saw there was this thing they could unscrew. So they unscrewed it, took the chain off dragged us off to jail. We were in jail for like 45 minutes, if I remember. And then we had a, you know, we had a trial over it. We all pled not guilty. We had a trial. Of course, we were convicted and I did community service. So that was my first experience with civil disobedience. Uh, incidentally, the Dolphin Show ended up closing three or four years later. They had a change, Knott's Berry Farm had a change of management. We kept on protesting them. The new manager said, what do we have to do to make the protest stop? Ava said, close the dolphin show, and they said, okay. So it was nice. Our campaign worked. Wow. So I would continue with uh, civil disobedience a few times. I think over a period of five years, I was probably arrested 15 times, 20 times. Wow. I've had three convictions. So I'm a lawyer now, and the, the technical definition of an arrest is whenever a police officer or whenever somebody stops you, you're not, you're not free to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're arrested. And so there was one time, for example, when uh, President Bill Clinton was going to a fundraiser and me and some people were able to get into the fundraiser. We were stopped by the, uh, the police ever so briefly. That's technically an arrest because we weren't free to leave. And then we were kicked out. So when I say that I was arrested 15, 20 times, it doesn't mean I've gone through the court process. It just means that I bent the rules. You know, I, I violated the law. And then most of the time they just say, you know, get out of here, don't come back. And that's the end of it. Uh, and then I, I've become much more uh, verbal. I've become much more outspoken. I've been interviewed on television. There was a cable TV show that the, uh, the cable TV shows have to give a certain amount of time to the community. And so one of the people who had a community TV show, she wanted to talk with me about uh, how the gorillas were at the Los Angeles Zoo. Uh, I was invited to England to talk about this lawsuit. So I, in 2001, I went to England and I spoke at three or four different venues there about this lawsuit. Uh, one of the venues was like a, a vegan society, as I remember. Another venue was, there was a law school there in England and they wanted to, to talk with me about that. So I was able to tour around England with it. Um, I've been published in a few books. I've been published not only what I've written in a few books, but I've also been written about. There's a book called Vegetarians in America, or Vegetarian America, which is a history of vegetarianism in America. And on the very last page, a very distinguished last page, right before they went to press, they, the two authors asked me about my lawsuit here again. And they wrote at the very uh, last page that Mr. Friedman was involved in a lawsuit that says that veganism is the functional equivalent of a religion or something like that. So I've been mentioned in a few books. I was involved as a plaintiff in a lawsuit against Adidas for 30 years at the time. Adidas was selling uh, soccer cleats, soccer shoes that was made from the skin of kangaroos. And when these soccer shoes were being sold for 30 years, California had a law on the books, which is kind of like the Endangered Species Act. So the Endangered Species Act is a law for the entire country. So California had its own Endangered Species Act just for California. And kangaroos were protected in the California Endangered Species Act. And yet Adidas was selling kangaroo skin, which was illegal, it was a crime. For 30 years, nobody did anything about it. And so there was an organization called Viva USA and its executive director, Lauren Ornelas, 
who wanted to file a lawsuit to make California enforce its law against Adidas. And we decided that there was going to be the organization Viva USA in the lawsuit, and then we wanted to have an individual, and so I was the individual, so both of us are named in the case. And we, we actually we won that case on paper. That case went all the way to the California Supreme Court, and the California Supreme Court upheld the California Endangered Species Act because the lower courts had said that the federal, the federal Endangered Species Act took precedence over the California Endangered Species Act. And because kangaroos had been on the federal Endangered Species Act, and then they were removed on the federal level, that California could not continue to protect kangaroos because the federal government removed it. And the California Supreme Court said that's rubbish. Uh, California will continue to pre protect any animals at once until the California legislature says otherwise. So we won at the California Supreme Court, which is wonderful. How many times have you been arrested and actually put in jail? Oh, how many times arrested? How many times I've been arrested and put in jail? I would say three or four times, and only one of them was significant. So I've been in jail for forty-five minutes at Knott's Berry Farm, maybe something else an hour. Everything was like real brief, but a group of us, seventeen people, protested the sale of fur at. Uh, Beverly at the Beverly Center in Los Angeles and Beverly Center is a real posh it is a huge shopping mall and one of the stores there which was Macy's West at the time Macy's West no longer sells fur but now that they did at the time 17 of us went into Macy's West and just did various things I, I did I locked myself to a railing again I guess it's just my thing <laughs> But this time I had a kryptonite, you know, the kryptonite bicycle U-lock. I had a U-lock around my neck. Yikes. And then I had a U-lock connecting that to a railing. And then I had a, some literature against fur and I had a megaphone. And so I locked myself down. I got the literature and I just started reading from the literature. So 17 of us were arrested. There were some other, I, I keep on saying 17, there were other people there like support, but 17 of us were arrested, men and women. And they, they escalated the charge, they overcharged us, is what we call on the law, uh, to burglary. And burglary has a very specific definition, this, this was not burglary. But because they charged us with burglary, it was a felony, felony arrest. And so they strip searched us at the jail and they kept us over the weekend. They kept us there for, I think I was there for two and a half days. And uh, all, of us, uh, all of us who were in jail uh, were on a hunger strike. So we just refused to eat until we were released. So I remember on the Monday we had a hearing before the judge. They tried to get us to sign a, an, a, 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 essentially put us on probation. They wanted to put us on probation if we were going to be let out of jail. They wanted us to promise to behave as it were. And most of us did not promise to behave. And then we left the courtroom and then the police officers, the, uh, the chief of police got rid of us. They didn't want us in their jail anyway. So it felt like kind of a ruse. They were going to let us go and they tried to coerce us into signing this agreement and then we didn't sign. But uh, so I, I was in jail at, for that instance for two and a half days. Wow. This reminds me of like the Starbucks thing where somebody glues their hand to the counter. Mm -hmm. You think that's effective? As a general principle, I don't think anyone should break the law. I think that there are some instances when the injustice is so urgent that something has to be done. So the example that I would give is that if there are some developers who are going to knock down some trees and some people want to climb those trees to save those trees while a legal team tries to save the trees in court, I think that's legitimate. But now going through everything I've been through, going through the legal process, becoming an attorney, learning more about Cesar Chavez, and his United Farm Workers and how they, uh, how they protested their, their strategies, looking at, at Gandhi, looking at other people who have pushed back against the courts, pushed back against the police. I think that when people are arrested, it might feel good. It might feel very good. I know that I felt good. When I, when I was arrested protesting for the dolphins, I, I just, I felt great. I was euphoric. It might feel good, but I think ultimately, when you look at all of the time that you put into a criminal defense 
and all of the money that you have to pay lawyers, and you look at the risk of a conviction, and a small crime in California, you could be in jail for a week, you could be in jail for 30 days. You know, we were arrested on burglary felony. If for some reason that stuck, you know, we could be in there for five years. And you look at taking somebody who is passionate for the animals and wants to save the animals and putting them on ice for five years, it's not worth feeling good. So as I said, you know, I understand if there is something urgent, that something has to change right now, we have to protect these trees right now. Uh, I'm seeing somebody who is beating a dog, or maybe that's not the best example. There is a dog in a hot car, and it's wrong to smash the windows, but if I don't smash the windows, the dog is gonna die. I understand the urgency. If it's not urgent, I don't think the right approach, all things considered, is to break the law. Uh, I'm not gonna say that absolutely, I, I think that there, there may be things that I just, I'm not thinking of right now. I'm not going to say absolutely, but in all, in all likelihood, we need to be extremely reluctant before we put ourselves on the line like that. There is some argument that when you get arrested, you get publicity. When you get publicity, there are more people who sympathize with you, but it could just as well be the other way. These people who glue their hands at Starbucks, a lot of people think that they're, they're idiots and it hurts. So maybe some people agree, some people disagree. I don't think that's an effective way to communicate the message. Uh, alternatively, there are ways to push the envelope without breaking the law, and that's what we should be doing. We should be making the people who are hurting animals so uncomfortable without us breaking the law, and we make them so uncomfortable that they end up breaking the law. And the reason why that's so valuable is because as institutions, the police, the courts, lawyers, they're all neutral as an institution. Of course, some individuals might like us, some individuals might not like us, but the, the government entities themselves are neutral. When we break the law, these neutral organizations come after us and they actually align themselves with the abusers. But if the other side breaks the law, then these neutral institutions go after the, after the other side. It is a much, much more effective way not to put our liberty at risk. You know, I, I can imagine many times when I just, I would be so upset about something that I would see or there would just be something that would really get my blood to boil and I would have that impulse like I, I have to do something now. I, I have to I have to do something now, and if I did something now, then maybe I would be in jail and I wouldn't be having this interview right now, right? Would you be going to jail to visit me and say, Jerry, why were you so stupid to you know, break that law and you're stuck here in jail? So, so I'm not gonna say any absolutes. I'm sure there are exceptions to every rule, but our, we should be overwhelmingly reluctant to break the law. Instead, we should look at the ways the laws are written and to say, we can get to our goal within the boundaries of the law, and then let the other side, let the abusers, let the destroyers, let them break the law. And then not only is it us against them, but it's gonna be the government against them. And I think it's also more sympathetic when people watching television see that, hey, there are these rowdy activists, but then the proprietor of the circus comes out with a baseball bat and starts hitting them. The person who's watching television, they might think the activists are rowdy, but why is the guy at the circus coming out with a baseball bat? And so it's also better in, in that sense that it will be more likely to earn the sympathy of people who don't know what's going on. But if we end up breaking the law, if we have the baseball bats, if we do whatever it is that we do, then that neutral viewer isn't necessarily going to understand what we're doing. What organizations do you think are the most effective right now at making a difference? Well, if I give you a few names, I'm going to forget a few and a lot of organizations <laughs> are going to say, what about us? The size of the organization doesn't matter to me. A lot of people say that the bigger organizations, they already have their money uh, and we shouldn't support bigger organizations. To me, big or small doesn't matter. The question to me is what is effective? If there's an organization with a very large staff and they get stuff done, I'll give them money. If there's an organization with a large staff, they don't get stuff done, I'll get, give my money someplace else. 
So with, with that being said, the organizations that I really love, I really love deeply, and I know the history, I know some of the individuals, I mean, I've been vegan for 30 years, I know a lot of people who are behind these organizations. And again, I, I'm gonna forget some. But the first organization that comes to mind is the Food Empowerment Project. This is run by Lauren Ornelas, and she's the person I mentioned with the uh, lawsuit uh, against Adidas from Viva USA. She founded her own organization. And the thing that I love about the Food Empowerment Project is that they are specifically targeting minorities to introduce to them veganism. And I think that there is, veganism has a reputation of being very white oriented or very, you know, people of European descent oriented. And that's one of the things that I love about, about Lauren's organization, the Food Empowerment Project, is because they are specifically looking to bring veganism to people who are not white. And that's incredibly valuable. I also uh, love the Peace Activist Network in Philadelphia. One of their programs, they have a vegan mentoring program. And so they advertise to the community and they say, look, if you're curious about veganism and you don't know where to start, we will link you, we will hook you up with a vegan mentor. And this vegan mentor is gonna help introduce you to veganism. This is the first organization that's done it. I know some other organizations have done so afterwards. Stop Animal Exploitation Now, S-A-E-N. Pronounced sane, like, you know, sane or insane, but it's S-A-E-N. And the organization is mostly run by a married couple. And what they do is they go through medical research records, Freedom of Information Act. They get these medical research records. They look at everything that these vivisectors are doing wrong. And a vivisector is, uh, viva means living and sect means cut. So a vivisector is a scientist or a researcher who actually cuts living animals. They're the animal, animal testers, right? Animal experimenters, vivisectors. And they get vivisectors fired. They get, because, they, because the animal vivisectors are uh, conducting cruel experiments, they have all these animals who die because they're not being fed. There's just all sorts of things that these vivisectors are doing crazy wrong. And the, the organization finds these things that are being done wrong and they get them fired. They get the institution uh, fined for breaking the, breaking the laws. And, and they do this with a minimum of, of staff. It's, it's just a very efficient organization. They've done some tremendous things over the years. Also in that part of the country, there's an organization called SHARK, which stands for show, show is SH for shark, show animals respect and kindness. And they've done a lot of rodeo protests. They've done a lot of hunt saboteurs. And they're very, they're very effective at uh, getting media and you know saying you know we shouldn't have these rodeos they'll have the video cameras at the rodeos and showing the insane cruelty of what goes on in rodeos i remember one of their videos i saw where a lasso was wrapped around the neck of a calf and the calf goes running and the calf gets jerked back and the calf's like esophagus pops out so that they they catch these you know videos they show the electric prods and the rodeo says no we don't use electric prods and then here it is on video so and so there are a lot of these smaller organizations that I really, I deeply respect, deeply admire because the individuals are so passionate and they're just, you know, they're good people. Uh, nutritionfacts.org is a website that is uh, clinical nutritional research for humans. And it's on, it's on the inter internet, nutritionfacts.org. And so anybody who has any question about human nutrition whether they're vegans or not, they can go to this website and it explains if you want to know about vitamin B12, if you want to know about prostate cancer, whatever it is you want to know about, you put it in the search engine and it gives you all of this wonderful science-backed information of the best way to live if you have prostate cancer, if your friend has prostate cancer or whatever the, the health topic is. And what is so much better about this website, about this service than all the other doctors is that everything is backed up with scientific citations. I know plenty of doctor websites. I'm not gonna give them the, the joy of mentioning their names. And they come up with crazy ideas and they don't say where their ideas come from. So the idea, the silly idea, for example, that eating soy makes a, gives a man boobs, for example. 
which explains why all the Chinese men have big breasts, right? Because they eat so much soy. But there's a, a doctor in mind who says that if you eat soy, if you're a man, you eat soy, you'll get breasts. And he doesn't give any scientific citation. He just says it. And so other people say, oh, I read a doctor who said I shouldn't eat soy if I'm because I'm going to get breasts, right? And so that's the wonderful thing about nutritionfacts.org is that they actually back everything up and they say this is the study. You could read it yourself. This is another study. You can read it yourself. So these are the smaller organizations that I think are very effective. Again, I'm not disparaging larger organizations. If they show results, they're wonderful. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, what do you think would be the most powerful way to make progress right now? So what I, what I think of as the most powerful way to make progress, I divide everyone into being an activist and being a passivist. The single most powerful way for anyone to make change is to be a pacifist and to stop eating animals, stop buying animals, stop buying leather, stop buying whatever it is, because the entire reason why we have this problem is because we are consumers and we are consuming the bodies of these non-human animals. So when we stop consuming them, there's no reason for these slaughterhouses and vivisectors and furriers to, to kill these animals, to make them miserable. It's the same idea as why we don't have whales in our society anymore. We stopped buying whales. We stopped paying for people to kill whales. And now the whale populations are pretty well coming back. So it's the same idea. We do the same thing with cows. We do the same thing with chickens. We do the same thing with minks. We do the same thing with fishes. We just do the same thing and we stop consuming them. And if people who hear this interview want to make one change in their life, that is the one change to do. So that's being a pacifist. But then if you want to do more than that, and I would ask you to do more than that, being a pacifist is not enough, I don't think. Then you want to be an activist. And to be an activist, it just means you need to speak up. You need to find some way that you are comfortable speaking up. It might be writing letters to the editors. It might be writing uh, an article, writing a story. You might be a poet and you go to a poetry reading and you write, read a poem about it. If you are a researcher, start researching plant-oriented medicines and stay away from the animal-oriented medicines. I know a lot of professionals who will integrate some sort of activism in their, in their career, in their profession. I know a lawyer here in Houston and he has vegan literature in his lobby. So his clients come in or other People who want to legal services come in and there, there is literature there. Uh, get involved in protests. Uh, how you vote matters. So right now it's 2022. I just learned that uh, Dr. Mehmet Oz, who is running for Senate in Pennsylvania, I just learned that he's a vivisector. He has killed over 300 dogs in his career. He's killed over 30 pigs. There's, there was this expose that was published about it. And so who we vote for matters. And so if you are against using animals in experimentation and you vote for Dr. Oz as your senator, then you can bet if there's some anti-vivisection legislation, you know how he's going to vote. And so how you vote matters. In my life, I found areas that I'm comfortable being an activist. At first, when I joined Orange County People for Animals, I was stuffing envelopes. That was the limit of my, act my activism. And over time, I looked at my boundaries. I looked at what I was comfortable with, what I wasn't comfortable with, was not comfortable with. And I would take one step into something that was not in my comfort zone. And then that step, that became comfortable. And then I took another step. And you keep on taking those steps. And so I don't think that somebody needs to be an activist and needs to grab a megaphone and needs to start protesting on day one. If you're not comfortable doing that, don't do it. But do something. And then maybe in a week, a month, a year, you'll grab that megaphone and you'll protest. Do you think disruptions are effective? Like when somebody goes into a restaurant and they're doing the megaphone thing or, a, or a, you know, like, because I, you know, I hear a lot of people think, you know, saying, expressing that they just don't think that's effective. It maybe it turns people off more. So legally speaking, a disruption is by definition, it's illegal. It's illegal to disrupt a business. And I don't think people should be breaking the law. 
like when they go into a, a grocery store and they start, you know, like speaking out loud to people about what's Correct. what. Yeah. When somebody goes onto private property, a private business, mm -hmm. that property, so a grocery store, that grocery store land and building, it has a business purpose for you to be their customer to buy food. And you get a right to go onto that property as long as you're in that scope, mm -hmm. all right? You can go into a grocery store and leave and you're not gonna get arrested. But what happens is if you go into a grocery store and you're outside of that scope of permission, you're not there to buy food, right? You're there to disrupt. That's breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And the police can come and arrest you and I don't think that's effective. Wow. I didn't realize that. And there's a lot of people that do that. There are a lot of people that do that. There are a lot of people who think they understand the law and they don't. I, without naming names, I met a animal rights guy. He used to be military police. And he told me the way the laws are. And I disagreed. And I showed him the actual laws itself. And he shut up. This guy was military police. You know, whether military or... Police or not, doesn't really matter, right? But he was, he was a police officer. He understood the law, and he didn't understand the law. He thought he understood the law. So just keep in mind, you go into somebody's house, you have permission to be in their house, they tell you to leave, you have to go. If you don't go, it's breaking the law. The same thing with the restaurant, same thing with the grocery store. You could go to a mayor's office. Now, just because the mayor's office is public property, because it's owned by the city, the mayor's office has a business purpose. The business purpose is to conduct business for the city. You can't protest in the mayor's office uh, because you don't have permission to go there and protest. It's not within the scope of that land. How is this different than you chaining yourself to the, to, you know, to the places you chained yourself? I guess you knew you were going to get arrested or you at least got arrested and somehow that was still effective though, right? So when I risked arrest before, mm -hmm. I did not understand the law. I mean, I understood like generally what the law was like, but I didn't really understand the law. I was pretty new to veganism. I was pretty new to the politics. And it's only me going through this process and learning about other people who have been through this process have I come to the conclusion where I am now. Mm -hmm. But those were effective though, some of those. Like the dolphins, you know, wasn't that effective? Of the three times that I was arrested and convicted, I've got three convictions. I think two of them were effective, which is not to say that we would not have been effective a different way. And so even though two of them were effective, it is entirely possible. It, I mean, you're, you're asking the crystal ball. It is entirely possible that we might have done something less effective or we might have done something more effective. But what I can tell you is that when people break the law, they run the high risk of really messing up their life. And you have to, you have to measure that is, is the risk of somebody really messing up their life, having something on their record and they can't get a job or it's more difficult to get a job or going to jail for 30 days or going to jail for a year. Is it really the, the right way to speak out for animals? Especially because when you're doing it, you don't know if you're going to be effective anyway. I mean, if you ask me, Jerry, if you break this law, and we will save 50 cows guaranteed, I'd probably break it. But nobody can give that guarantee, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's always a guess. It's a guess. It is, it's a guess no matter how you go. And so the principle is we can have effective demonstrations, effective protests, effective campaigns. We can be effective. We can push the boundaries of the law, but you stay on the legal side. You push the boundary. You stay on the legal side you don't get in trouble and then you can continue being an activist. So somebody wants to protest against a store or a grocery store, they could just do it outside, right? Correct. So the question then is, and this is the good follow-up question, thank you. Well, how do we push the envelope? Yeah. How do we get to that edge? Mm -hmm. The way you do that is you have to understand, and you'll talk to a lawyer about this. You'll have to understand what is the nature of the property you're on because some for example, some parking lots you can protest on and some parking lots you can't. And the law may change from year to year, so you don't take my advice now. But the principle is, if it is a single business 
like there is a Trader Joe's in a parking lot and no other stores, you have fewer rights. But if there are a number of businesses and a parking lot, you have more rights. The reason for that is that these laws are designed around the idea of the town squares that we used to have. We used to have a town square where people would gather, people would talk, people would actually have a soapbox and stand up on it. And all around the town square, there's a bunch of businesses. And so when you have this town square environment, you have more rights. But if it's just one isolated store, you have fewer rights. And so depending upon the, the land, then you either have to be on the sidewalk or you can be in the parking lot and you can protest. And the way to protest is to be annoying. You want to follow when, when somebody parks their car, you want to be there when they park the car, when they get out, you should be say six feet back. You don't want to get too close because they'll say that you're in my personal space. You'll be six feet back. And as they walk to the store, you constantly tell them why they should not do business at the store. Please don't shop at the store. They sell, um, they sell live crabs, they sell live lobsters. It's extremely cruel what they do. And you talk to them constantly as they go to the store. You talk to them constantly as they go back to their car. You do that with everyone. You wanna be annoying. So when you do that, you are expressing your First Amendment rights. You're protected by the First Amendment. You are communicating a political message. You're trying to communicate about a matter of public importance. Public importance is cruelty to animals. You will have the most legal protections when you do that. But you step inside the store and you refuse to leave and they'll arrest you. Wow. I've seen some activists, I mean, that you would think would know better because of their credentials. Maybe they have similar credentials to yours. Uh, I guess they're pushing the envelope, breaking the law, and, and maybe they're doing that to set some precedent in the law or something. I don't know if I'm articulating this right. <laughs> could it be that maybe breaking the law could be effective sometimes? Well, as I said, I think if there's something of particular urgency, there's something yeah. happening right now. Mm -hmm. Like if you're saving an animal or something. As a lawyer, I would rather, so the example of the, the dog in the hot car, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. There's something urgent. As a lawyer, I would rather somebody call the police, call animal control and have them break the window. Mm -hmm. But you may not have that opportunity, right, of the urgency. So personally, I think that, it's, that, that there are gonna be instances when you have no choice. This is actually built into the law. There's actually something called a defense of necessity. And the easiest way to explain the defense of necessity is, uh, you're, you have a pregnant woman in the car, she's gonna give birth, the hospital is however many miles away and you run red lights. And because of the necessity, it's like a balancing of the evils, right? The evil of running a red light or the evil of having this person giving birth and who knows, dying or, or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, there's hundreds of different scenarios, so that's the idea. And so the idea of breaking the window to save the dog, you would have a defense of necessity, whether that wins or not, I, I can't say. And so I think the campaigns that you're referring to, they want to expand the defense of necessity to say that I had to break into this place to remove this animal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the theory behind it. I just, I don't think that's a winning theory. I don't think if there's no urgency right then, right then, right then, the defense of necessity is not gonna work. And it, we might have the moral cause for it, but legally it's not gonna work. And because legally it's not gonna work, I can't say that these campaigns will fail. I don't have the crystal ball. Mm -hmm. I just think that it is the hard way to do it. Why do you wanna do this the hard way? Why do you want to risk a year in jail, five years in jail, 10 years in jail? Why do you wanna risk that? So. I've often fascinated about like how I could do more locally. Thought about like, well, I could just set up a table somewhere and just kind of talk to people and that's kind of a mellow approach. I could do that on the sidewalk, right? And as long as I'm not disrupting anybody, I can talk all day, right? And even if it's just one store, I can, as long as I'm not disrupting anybody per se. Now, wh how do you know when you're disrupting and when you're just sharing information? Is there, is there, is there a difference there? So the, the, the magical answer is it really depends. Yeah. And that's what most lawyers and most police and most, most legal minds will tell you it depends. 
one of the big times, one of the big ways that it depends is what state are you in. Some states are more friendly and some states are less friendly. California has some very friendly laws. As I recall, New Jersey have, has very friendly laws for free speech. Uh, I believe Tennessee has real friendly laws for free speech, but you really need to know the laws that apply to where you are. So yeah. in broad terms, you are the safest on sidewalks and parks, uh, public parks, not private parks. You are also safest, uh, safest on the public streets, but when you want to protest in the public streets, normally you have to coordinate with the city. So if you want to have a march going down Main, Main Street, for example, you would go to the city, you would get a permit, and then, you, and then you could have a march down Main Street. And pretty much they'll give you the permit. So sidewalks, parks, and streets, you have the most rights. Uh, otherwise, you really need to talk to a lawyer or you need to talk to somebody who knows the rules where you are. Because even a table on the sidewalk police might cite you to say you need a permit to have a table here because mm -hmm. you're blocking the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And if you were standing there, they couldn't say anything. They couldn't say anything legally. You could stand there and talk to people. You can hand out literature on the public sidewalk all day. They can't do anything about it, right? Uh, but if you actually have something physically blocking there, if you use amplified sound, if you use a megaphone, for example, you can do that during normal business hours, but the city might have a law that says you can't do it after 10 o'clock at night. You can't do it before seven o'clock in the morning or what have you. There are just entirely too many laws that could apply and so you really want to talk to a lawyer who's there. But in principle, I encourage people to push the envelope. Now keep in mind, I became vegan, the, the start of my journey to veganism was talking to people at a table. That was my start. And maybe if you have your table on the sidewalk, you'll find some people and that'll be their start as well. That might be. If you want more immediate change, we can't be as uh, passive as having a table. We need to be more active. We need to make people uncomfortable going to stores that are selling live crabs and live lobsters, if that's, if that's the campaign you're after. Whatever campaign you're after, you look at where the money is. The money's in the grocery stores, the money is wherever the money is, and that's where you wanna go and make people uncomfortable to make those customers go away. What are ag-gag laws? So ag gag, so ag is for agriculture and gag is, you know, putting a, a sock in somebody's mouth. Mm -hmm. And so an ag gag law is a law that prevents people from speaking against agriculture. And then how these laws manifest, they manifest in different ways. So some ag gag laws will say you cannot video record uh, inside of a slaughterhouse. Or they may say that you can't, um, you can't walk into the, you know, even if a slaughterhouse is open, uh, for people are just coming and going like there are some slaughterhouses particularly small slaughterhouses that customers will drive and park and then they go into the place and they pick whatever animal they want to have killed and, and so there's kind of a transactional slaughterhouse as opposed to a big factory slaughterhouse and in these smaller slaughterhouses they may say that if you um, whatever it is whatever reason you're there if you're not there to buy then you're automatically committing a crime even though you're just a member of the public. And so there's just a variety of ways to scare you, to prevent you from exercising your free speech in, a, in the context of agriculture. Mm -hmm. There's even food disparagement laws that say if you publish something that disparages, that defames uh, food, which could be animals, mm -hmm. uh, that you could be uh, up for a crime, you could be uh, guilty of a crime of uh, food disparagement. Uh, this was famously in the case where Howard Lyman, Howard Lyman was a fourth generation cattle rancher. He used to raise cows for slaughter. And through his life journey, he became vegan and he became very outspoken against the slaughter of cattle and other animals. He was invited on uh, Oprah Winfrey's show. And as he was talking to Oprah Winfrey about mad cow disease, and back then mad cow disease was pretty new. It was, uh, I think we'd only been talking about it in the country for maybe a year or two years. Oprah Winfrey said on, on her show that she'll never eat a hamburger again. And so she ended up getting sued and Howard Lyman was sued and, uh, for food disparagement by people in Texas. And these cattle ranchers in Texas say like, you can't say that about hamburgers. And so that is a type of an ag gag law. It's something that is trying to silence people from speaking out against agriculture. So, so some people, they get, they get into this and they get really gung-ho. Like we, tonight we were at 
uh, Pythagoras for dinner. And Ruzi, the owner, he started out gung-ho as an activist that was going out there and protesting. And his evolution, or he evolved to taking a different approach and starting a restaurant. And he talks to people and he feeds people and that's his approach. You know, I think a lot of people start off really gung-ho like that. They want to push the envelope. They, they want to do everything they can. I guess that like what I'm hearing you say is find a lawyer that's local that you can, you know, inquire like, hey, how can I do this and get away with as much as possible, <laughs> essentially, right? So you'd want to find a lawyer to understand the rights of the land you're on. Mm -hmm. And the important distinction there is that some sidewalks are public, some sidewalks are private. You don't always know which is which. Yeah. You could be si standing on one side of the street breaking the law. On the other side of the street, you're not breaking the law. Wow. And so somebody like a lawyer would be a good person to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also get, I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. How, how can somebody find a lawyer? Is that, is that easy to do? Like you're a civil rights lawyer, right? Is that the yeah. kind of lawyer they need? So there are two major organizations that, uh, that are specialized in free speech. There's probably more. There are two that I deal with. Uh, one is called the National Lawyers Guild. And this is a national organization of lawyers. They're headquartered in New York and they have a lot of local chapters. And so there's a local chapter in Los Angeles where I'm at, for example. And so anybody can go to the National Lawyers Guild, nlg.org, and there's going to be a list of lawyer referrals, or you can contact the office and say, look, I want to have a protest here. I want to do something here, and I need to know what my rights are. I don't want to break the law. Okay. The other organization people know is the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Same thing. So anybody should be able to contact either of these. Uh, and again, there's going to be other organizations, like the NAACP, for example, is a good organization that should be able to give the same kind of information. In California, also a national organization, but in California, there's the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and these lawyers are uh, all animal oriented. So if you're an animal activist and you want to learn the laws, they should be able to help you as well. So I would probably contact one of these national organizations. And if any of these fail for some reason, if people are too busy, I know as a lawyer, I'm always too busy. If you can't get information from that, you can just go to uh, what are called bar associations. And so in this sense, a bar is the um, bar admission. It's a, it's a legal term. Uh, and so you can go to the local bar association and you can say, I'm looking for a First Amendment attorney. I'm looking for a free speech attorney. I'm looking for an attorney who can help me um, uh, protest and not get arrested. Mm -hmm. and, and they should be able to find a lawyer. And I guess that's going to cost a little bit of money for that consultation, probably. I... I can't say yes or no to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, every lawyer, generally is, speaking, I mean, every lawyer is different. Me personally, I give free advice to animal activists. I give free advice to non-animal activists. Yeah. If somebody wants to do good in the world, mm -hmm. they want five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes of my time. I'll give it to them. Mm -hmm. Totally worth it for me. But, and there's a lot of lawyers who will do that for free. Yeah. If you find a lawyer who's charging a consultation free fee, keep looking. And if you just can't find a free lawyer, then, okay, maybe you have to pay a consultation fee. Right, right. Tell us a little bit more about this 30-year journey. You have a, an extensive resume. Is there something in your resume that we didn't cover that would be cool to share? In my 30 years of being an animal activist, I think that the most impact I have had is helping develop a community of activists who feel like they can rely on each other. So being around for 30 years, I've met a lot of people. I'll be the first person to say, I am not an animal activist to be friends. I would be an animal activist if I was the only vegan in the world. It's who I am. But one of the reasons why people associate with tribes, one of the reasons why people associate with a political party, with a national, um, any national organization, or even a fashion label, some people are just crazy over fashion labels is because to them, whatever this tribe is, it represents community to them. And so I think that it's very important that animal activists understand that we are the, we are the front line of a major revolution in societies all over the world. What we do, this is the toughest revolution. 
And it's the toughest revolution because it's easy for humans to say that we're not a cow. Like, I'm, I'm never going to be in the slaughterhouse. I'm never going to have my throat cut for food. And so it's easy for me to separate myself from the cow. Um, and because it's so easy to separate myself, it's, it's easy for people just to hold animal rights at a distance and not be part of it. It's very different if you are being targeted because of your race or your gender or your age or your sexual orientation. It's much more real and you can't escape it as well, right? But we humans, we can escape the slaughterhouse because we're just not on the menu. And so it's much more difficult, I believe, for animal activists to be animal activists than other, than other progressive groups, than other organizations who are trying to make change um, because there, there aren't that many of us uh, because it's so easy for the general population not to be involved. And so I've known activists or people who have wanted to be activists and they have some bad experiences and they retreat and they're still vegan, they still believe in animal rights, but they're not going outside their home to, to do anything anymore. So I think that's been my greatest contribution is that I'm very kind to other vegans, even if I don't like them personally, I'm still kind to them. And I try to nurture cooperation and you know, I want to call it friendship. It doesn't have to r rise to that level of friendship. It could just be acquaintances or something. And I just, it's, it is such difficult movement to be in that I think that's my, my biggest contribution is just listening to other activists, holding my judgment back and just trying to help, trying to help however it is. I became a lawyer because I had this experience of being involved in civil disobedience breaking the law and seeing that it, it seemed to me like there was a, a need for animal rights attorneys. And so I wanted to be able to contribute in ways that I thought I was uh, particularly good at. And I love to argue, you know, I, and so now I get to be a lawyer, I get to argue and I get to do something good as a lawyer. There's a lot of lawyers who represent, I'll say bad people. It's good that they're a lawyer and it's good that they represent these people, but that's not what I want to do with my life as a lawyer. I don't want to help a rapist get you know, free if, if they're guilty. That's not my contribution to society. My contribution to society is to help free speakers, to help activists speak. Before I was an attorney, I was a computer programmer and I would, I enjoyed being a computer programmer but I didn't have that emotional satisfaction that in my day job, I'm actually making the world a better place. And so by becoming a lawyer, now I feel that as my day job, I'm helping the world become a better place. And so I think to people listening, I think that's something that I would, I would encourage them to think about is what can they do in their job to make the world a better place, particularly for, for the non-human animals who suffer unimaginable cruelty. And then the other way that I think that I've contributed a lot, again, because I enjoy arguing, is that I've, I've written some articles and some books. I've been published and I was one of the only anti-vivisection authors to be published in the American Journal of Bioethics. It was a while ago, I don't remember the name of the journal. I think it was the American Journal of Bioethics. And this American Journal of Bioethics is a bunch of people who kill animals for science, or that's what they say they do. And they talk about killing animals for science. Uh, a lawyer friend of mine was invited to write an article about what's called chimeric research. And chimeric research, the chimera, some people say chimera, the chimera, is a combination of different animals in one body. So in the Greek mythology, the chimera had a lion's body and had a snake for a tail and I think had a goat head on one shoulder and I don't remember off the other shoulder and so it was just this mixture of different animals like a Frankenstein kind of an animal of all these animals put together. And so there was a researcher who was studying or trying to get mice to create human sperm and of course the first thought is like, why? But if no other reason, he's going to get paid for it. 
If no other reason, he's going to get published, and vivisectors like to be published in these journals. And so this vivisector actually was published about getting mice to create human sperm. And so this lawyer friend of mine was invited to write a counterposition to that. And so that lawyer friend of mine and a clinical psychologist and I, the three of us, wrote an article. It was much softer than I would have written it. It was not hardline because this was a journal of vivisectors. And if we were too hardline, they would kick the article out. So if you find the article, understand I would have been much more pointed, but we got it published. And that's what we were arguing in that article. It was essentially, this is the craziest thing. There is no reason to do, that, do this. It's bad for the animals. It's bad for humans. It's bad for science. It's bad, 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 bad. And so I've been published in some unusual places. I've been published in a cultural encyclopedia of vegetarianism. I was published in a book talking about the Adidas lawsuit that I was involved in. Uh, and so I think that this other contribution that I've made over the 30 years is to put out some literature, what I hope to be high quality literature, but to put out some literature and so that people in other parts of the United States, other pe people in other parts of the world, wherever they may be, and other people tempor temporally, after I die, people are going to be able to read my thoughts. And so I hope in, in some way, some fashion, that this is sort of a legacy that's going to live on. It's kind of the same reason why I'm doing this interview. I'm hoping that YouTube lasts much longer than, than I do, or wherever this video goes. What do you think about Elon Musk's Neuralink and the experiments they're doing there? So I have two compatible philosophies. I'm pro-science, I'm pro-sovereignty. And sovereignty means for humans and non-humans, no experimentation. So I am all in favor of Elon Musk's doing whatever his heart desires within ethical bounds. And those ethical bounds are you leave other animals alone, you leave other well, animals being both human and non-human, you leave other animals alone unless, and this is the rule of experimentation, there is informed consent. There is never going to be a circumstance where you can go to a chimpanzee or a dog or a rabbit and get their informed consent. You will say, hey, I want to put this chip in your brain, and they've got no idea what's going on. You, you can't get informed consent. And so that means we can never, never, never do these experiments on non-human animals. But if there's a human animal and you get informed consent from them, there you go. Because the Neuralink is like, has a lot of astronomically insane potential to help with all kinds of things. So the way that science is supposed to proceed, <laughs> so I'm not here as an anti-vivisection um, advocate, but I am an anti-vivisection advocate. So the way that science works is you want to get as equal an environment as you can to test your science. If you want to test a rocket ship for space, you want to test it in space, right? Whatever you want to develop, you want to test that in the environment that you're trying to develop it for. And so just on that principle, if you want to do a Neuralink test, for the human consumer, for the human patient, you want to test that in humans. The problem with using non-humans, and this goes with everything in vivisection, this goes with drugs that we use, this goes with surgical techniques, this is everything, is that when you experiment on a non-human animal, you will get a result. When you experiment the same thing on the human animal, you might get the same result, you might get a different result. And so what are you doing this for? And it's also the case that when you experiment on a non-human animal of species A, a dog, you get one result. You do species B, a rat, you get a different result. You do a horse, you get a different result. Which one works for the human? One of the reasons I do this, if I'm a vivisector, I write a research paper on the dog. I get paid, I get published. I do it on the rat. I get paid, I get published. I do it on the horse. I get paid, I get published. Mm -hmm. So there is a profit incentive to do that, but it's bad science because you roll the dice here, 
You roll the dice here, maybe they match, maybe they don't, and you cannot predict it. So do you think there's a way he could avoid using animals and, and still accomplish his goals with Neuralink? Yes. So the, the paradigm for that is that there are going to be other ways to develop any technology. So they may use human corpses, they may use computer models, and they can test this uh, Neuralink, this machinery, these electronics, without using non-human animals. And then when that science is developed well enough, then you get people's informed consent, humans' informed consent, and then you test it on humans. Now we'll go one step farther. Why do we need a Neuralink? If the idea is we get a Neuralink, if we kill a million chimpanzees, if we kill a billion chimpanzees, why do we need a Neuralink? Human history, we've been doing fine for uh, 250,000 years in our current anatomy and you know, millions of years as, as earlier anatomies as our ancestors, as Homo erectus, as Homo habilis. There has been no point in our history that we've needed a Neuralink. So I'm sure technology is fun, right? It's fine, it's convenient. We have cars now, that's great. But if the equation is that in order for us to have a car, in order for us to have a Neuralink, we have to kill all of these non-human animals, and it may not even be helpful because it might be the wrong result, that's terrible. And let's go with that example. Let's say it is the wrong result. Let's say the Neuralink would work in a human, but we haven't used humans yet, but it would work. And we test it on dogs, it doesn't work. We test it on horses, it doesn't work. We test it on chimpanzees, it doesn't work. Well, we just lost the Neuralink, but had we tested on human corpses, maybe it would have worked. And so again, this is like the science of it, and the science just doesn't make sense. You want to test technology, you want to test drugs, you want to test whatever it is you're testing on the individual, on the species, as close as you can get for the good, for the better results. With their consent. With their consent. <laughs> yeah, we have a long history of not having consent, and that just, it never goes well. It never goes well. Do you think it will ever be against the law to eat animals? So I, I would put that parallel to look at all the things that are against the law now and they still go on. Slavery is against the law. Uh, there's still slavery. So would it ever be against the law to eat animals? Well, it's against the law to eat human animals. I imagine tomorrow it'll be against the law to eat chimpanzees. Maybe next week it'll be against the law to eat dolphins. I can imagine that. Because society's values continue to change, we realize there is no physical need to eat animals, and it is a nightmare for them when we eat them. It is an absolute nightmare. Why do that? And as an ethical vegan, for 30 years, how do you stay positive, strong, and sane in such a sick world? Uh, three questions, three answers. Positive, <laughs> strong, and sane. Maybe I'll take them in reverse order. How do you stay sane in such a sick world, or at least... Yeah, there was a book I never read, but the book title did it for me, and so everybody who says don't judge a book by a cover, maybe we should. There's a book title. My mother had this book, which was How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. I never read the book, but the book title does it as well. The world is not free, not in a lot of contexts, however you want to put it. We're consumers, we're, we have taxes, whatever, whatever you want to say. The world is not free, and we still have to find freedom. Uh, you know, how do I stay sane? I'm, you know, I'll say that I'm not sure that I am. I mean, I think I am. How does, how does a sane, how does an insane person know that they're insane? And, you know, there's, there's a philosophical problem. Or stay out of a dark place. Cause I'm yeah, gonna... I will rephrase your question. How do I stay grounded? There you go. And it goes back to we, the people who understand what is going on with non-human animals. We have to be good to each other. We have to support each other. I told you that if I was the only vegan, I would still be doing what I'm doing. M maybe not. If I didn't meet another vegan, maybe I wouldn't be vegan. You know, I'm telling you right now, you know, I'm the, the one strong vegan, I will never quit. But if it wasn't for others, I might be just like everybody else. I don't know. So, being sensitive to community to me is very important. Not just our vegan animal activist community, but 
family and, and, and friends, however they may be. I really think that's the only way I stay grounded. I don't know anything else that I do. You know, when I get uptight, when I get frustrated, when I get depressed, when I get fatigued, whatever it is, I have little tricks that I do to distract myself, to escape. I'll watch a movie, right? I'll, I'll lose myself someplace. I don't think that's a particularly effective medicine. It works for the moment, but long-term, I don't think it's effective. What is effective long-term is spend time with friends, whether you talk about your frustrations or not. Be part of community. Why are we alive? Why do we care? So. You must have a lot of vegan friends. Been around 30 years. Yeah. Could you be with somebody who isn't vegan? The only way that I could be with someone who is not vegan is if I knew that they were on the path to becoming vegan. So there is kind of, I'll say kind of a, almost a silly problem with me being with someone who's not vegan. And I, I maybe it's not so silly, but I imagine if I was going to kiss somebody and I didn't know if they just ate um, a cow's ass, maybe there's going to be some cow flesh stuck in her teeth. And I just, I don't want to, I don't want to kiss that mouth, right? So that to me is kind of on the simple side, but on the much more deep, emotional, meaningful side, it would be difficult for me to feel intimate, emotionally intimate, not physically. It would be difficult for me to feel intimate with someone who doesn't understand the, the murder and the misery of all of these animals and they, they just don't care enough and they continue to eat them. I just couldn't do that. If I met somebody who was like me 30 years ago, who has been introduced to this information and it sounds good, it feels right, but I'm, it's just, it is so new to me, I'm not ready. If I met somebody like that, I could be with them in that circumstance. Because at least in that circumstance, you know, maybe they could brush their teeth more. And I'm kind of being silly, right? But maybe they could brush their teeth more. You know, that, that aspect I can withstand, but I would understand that emotionally, like they're on the path they're on the same path that I was on or they're on a similar path that I was on and they can get there. But if they are so closed off that they can, that they can watch or they can know that these, these innocent, I mean, these, these animals who are slaughtered, they've done nothing wrong. They've committed no crime and they have a death sentence. They have a death sentence when they're babies. And for someone to be able to know that and not care enough to stop eating them, I just can't be emotionally intimate with that person. I just, I don't like tribalism. I think that, I think we do a disservice with tribalism, but if you're talking about who, who I love in my life, who I live my life with, who I share my life with, they have to be my tribe. They just have to be. And I'll say exclusively my tribe is veganism. I don't, I don't feel like I need to say this, but they don't have to be my, my race, my age, my whatever. They have to be vegan. That's my tribe. You know, in uh, the Blue Zones, every, you know, a lot of us are familiar with the Blue Zones, right? I mean, and that's one of the characteristics of a healthy life, is having a tribe. The Blue Zones are especially valuable. Uh, and so let me just state for anyone who doesn't know what the blue zones are, a blue zone is uh, depending upon the other videos they watch, but a blue zone is a part of the planet and the, the geography doesn't matter, it's the people. It's part of the planet with a population of people who live longer and healthier than other parts. And so I don't remember, there's like seven areas. There's uh, Sicily and Okinawa, Japan and Sardinia, there's um, even a Loma Linda in California. So there are these populations of people where they have the fewest diseases and they live the longest. And the most impactful reason, as I understand, for these blue zones are two. One, they have a minimum of animal products. It's not necessarily zero, but it's a minimum. So for example, the people who were studying in Okinawa, if I recall, 95% of their diet is uh, sweet potato or Japanese yams, 95%. And 5% is like rice and fish and I don't, I don't remember what else. And so they don't have to have zero animal products. 
uh, which is not to say that they shouldn't have zero, but for these studies were, uh, for these studies of these people, they didn't have to have zero. The other important aspect of them was that the people, as I was talking about, the people are very involved with their community. And so I don't necessarily think of that as tribalism. What I, what I see that as, and maybe it is, but what I see that as is that the older people are not shunned. The older people continue to work. The older people continue to have purpose in life. The older people continue to uh, be involved in the development of the grandchildren, for example. And so you get shorter longevity, people die earlier when they're stuck in bed, they're watching TV, their kids don't visit them. What's the point of living? But in these blue zones, the older people have purpose. They have daily purpose. They have daily physical routines. You know, they're, they're involved. And so a combination of a minimum meet and involvement in the community are what make these blue zones so special. The more we see that they eat plants exclusively as much as possible, the longer they live. Correct. So the only blue zone that I know that was studied with zero meat were the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda. Uh, I don't know if the other blue zones, if any of them were free of meat, but I know that the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda were free of meat. And the studies showed that compared to non-vegetarians, these vegetarians lived an average, if I recall correctly, of seven years longer when they had zero meat. And so the question is, if you look at these Okinawans who have a little bit of fish, they may do better if they had none. Mm -hmm. We don't know. That just wasn't studied, right? The Loma Linda study was followed up with a study of a vegan population, um, but it wasn't a community of vegans like in Loma Linda where they all lived together, but these were individual vegans in different places. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that community aspect. But this uh, study of the vegans, uh, if I recall correctly, they lived like an extra three or four or five years more than the people in Loma Linda. And these are the ones who had zero animal products, zero cheese, zero eggs, zero, zero, zero. Uh, in fact, that's one of the great reasons why I like that website, nutritionfacts.org. There was a German study of blood. And the, the blood study was done between people who ate animals and people who didn't. We had the, the vegans and the non-vegans. And the vegans, as I recall, the vegans were deficient. And, and let me actually take another qualifier. These were vegans and non-vegans who did not particularly plan their diet. They just intuitively ate. They weren't following any regimen. So the vegans on average were deficient in nine vitamins and minerals. And the non-vegans on average were deficient in I think 13 vitamins and minerals. And so if you're not planning your diet, chances are you're deficient. But if you're vegan, you're deficient in fewer things. Mm -hmm. And this supports all these other studies that say that vegans tend to be the healthiest. Well, you know, the whole tribe thing, it, it, I think on average they had seven, if I recall correctly, people that they knew their entire life that, that was a part of their circle. And on average here, I think in America, we have like 1.5, which is I, like very small. I'm not surprised. Yeah, and we have some people who fail at being vegan. A lot of times people say, well, they probably just were lacking in support, you know, and lacking in that community aspect. And some of, even some of these carnivore people say, well, the vegans are more likely to be depressed. Well, I mean, maybe because we're so damn alone, you know? <laughs> um, we're so inundated with meat advertising. We are so inundated with ridicule and condemnation and people who don't want to understand us. We need community. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a, a group of religious people, uh, for example, and there's one person who's isolated, that one person will do better in the group. And that's what I would think of with vegans as well. And so if someone is an isolated or a nearly isolated vegan, I think that it's very important for them to, to reach out. And there are a number of websites uh, where you can find other vegans. There are social media sites where you find other vegans. And if the best you can do is that you have a friend in another country, you meet a vegan in another country, if that's the best you can do, then do it. Uh, I think that there is value, there is science uh, behind, the better communication is, is the better way to go uh, emotionally. And so if we can write a letter, that's great, but a phone call is better. Uh, but if you can see them in person, that's even, that's the best. You know, we, we are social animals and we need to have that, 
that, that almost physical experience. Um, so if, if the best you can do is to find a pen pal in a different country, then that's what you do. And maybe even going through the comments of these videos, people can find other vegans and other people who want to have a pen pal relationship or, or if you're in the same city, find, you know, go out and have coffee, go out and have a meal, go take a walk in the park, you know, do something, get involved. I mean, it was a lot harder to do 30 years ago, I'm sure. I did meet a, a peer group that was very energized and very emotionally strong people. And it was so easy for me to just integrate into that group and become and become one of them. It's, you know, I, I almost feel like this was my first family. Don't tell my mother. I almost feel this was my first family. It was just very easy. And, and I've just kept that up over the years. But the way that you pose the question is I, if I imagine if I had the inspiration to become vegan and I became vegan and my whole life I didn't know another vegan, I want to tell you I would stay vegan. I believe I would stay vegan. But that is a very hard role, a very hard road. If every person in my life, my family, my romantic interests, my professional uh, contacts, if everyone but me ate animals, you're talking to me after I've been vegan for 30 years and I'm, I have strong strength of spirit and I am defiant. But I can't tell you that this is the way I would be if, if I knew nobody for the last 30 years. And again, that's a, that's a crystal ball question. But I will tell you that it has been better with a vegan community. And so if I had the choice, 100% vegan community. I mean, it's group therapy. In the very worst, the very worst that we experience, the very worst feelings we get, the vegan community is group therapy. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to share? I read a book when I was in fifth grade uh, called Silver Fox. And in Silver Fox, it's a story about a boy named Max who took a shortcut through a forest to get to school. He was a high school. I think he was a, might have even been a junior high school student. He was pretty young, grade school. Anyway, he took a shortcut and he found this fox that was in a leg hold trap and he tried to open the trap and he wasn't strong enough, it was rusted. And he had a friend, his, uh, a friend of the crossing guard and he asked the crossing guard friend what he should do, he wanted to save the fox. And so between the two of them, they found uh, just a series of, of ways to help save the fox, talk to the, the trapper and the trapper's wife, he talked to the trapper's wife and the trapper's wife said, well, maybe my husband would release the fox, but you have to pay him. And so let's have a fundraiser. And he did a fundraiser at his school. But then what happens? The bully of the school steals the, the, the lunch pail full of money. And it's just a series of events, a series of events of him trying to save this fox. And every time he finds the fox, the fox is in worse shape because the fox is chewing through her leg to try to get out of the trap and, the, and losing blood and getting infected. And the fox is doing worse and worse. I won't tell you the end of the story. Please, if uh, you have the opportunity to read Silver Fox, it's, uh, it was good for me as a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old reading it. It's a good child's book. But there was a scene at the end when the boy's father, Max's father, wanted to teach Max how to shoot a, a pistol, wanted to shoot a gun. And so the father had a, a, a toy animal and he threw the toy animal in the air and told Max to shoot the animal and Max didn't do it. And he tried a few times and Max just didn't want to shoot the animal toy or not. And the father said, well, you know, some, some boys will shoot a gun, but my boy doesn't. And it's okay that you have compassion. This book probably did more for me to plant the seed, to want to be a veterinarian, to becoming an animal activist. It was a hugely inspirational book for me as a, as a nine-year-old. And the, the, message, the message is fundamentally what 
I wish everybody would understand that it doesn't do any human any harm to be good to other animals, not to eat them, not to wear their fur, not to wear their leather, not to do whatever it is that humans do that make the lives of non-humans so much more difficult. I wish that I wish that we only had one religion on this planet and that one religion was compassion. And if any of your viewers, if anyone watching this right now would read Silver Fox or recommend it or Charlotte's Web or one of these books, there's, there's a moral message in these books that, that just the world, the world would be so much better for non-humans and for humans. If we respect the lives of non-humans, we have to respect the lives of women. We have to respect the lives of other minorities. And it's not that difficult. You got a favorite quote you want to share? Albert Schweitzer was a physician maybe 70, 100 years ago. And he said that occasionally take a break, take a, take a moment and think about the things for which you spare yourself the sight. When we go to the grocery store and when people go to the grocery store and they buy a steak, buy a hamburger, they're sparing themselves of the sight of the animal getting slaughtered, getting their throat cut. So that would be the inspirational quote for me is, we live in a very sterile and protected world. We live in an ivory tower. Sometimes just stop and think about those things that you don't have to watch. As an attorney, I have a number of cases for vegans and animal rights activists. Right now I have two groups of cases. I have one case where I'm representing Ariana Humer and Hen Harbor. This is an animal rescue in Santa Cruz County. The animal rescue has around 300, close to 300 birds on three acres. And during a wildfire two years ago, Santa Cruz County went throughout the area and picked up all of these chickens that were abandoned. The residents were under an evacuation order and uh, they, when they evacuated, they left their backyard chickens behind. So Ms. Humer picked up a number of these chickens. When Ms. Humer was required to evacuate, she got a bunch of volunteers to help her evacuate, and one of the volunteers had complained to animal control, the county animal control, about horrendous conditions, about hoarding conditions there. The hoarding conditions were that there were already animals there at the rescue, and then all of the additional backyard hens that came in made it appear to be hoarding, but there was no hoarding. Two weeks after the fact, two weeks after Miss Humor and Hen Harbor had evacuated, Animal Control came in with an emergency warrant to seize all of the animals there under this idea that there was a hoarding going on. When Animal Control arrived, there was no hoarding condition. There was no medical emergency of anything, any sort. The hens were well taken care of. There was actually one hen out of 300 or so who had an open wound, but even that open wound had a bandage. That open wound was caused by a rooster that attacked her. Out of 300 chickens, that's a pretty good number. So Animal Control had taken these 300 or so animals, transported them to the Animal Control facility, and, uh, and there wasn't any, there was no legal reason for them to have done that. When we went to court, the first time when we went to court to force the government to prove that they had the lawful right to take those animals, the government, the animal control agency, was not able to prove that they had the right to take them, and the judicial officer uh, ordered animal control to give them all back. Animal control did not give them all back. They gave back around 200 animals with around 100 unaccounted for. Most of those 100 animals were given to other individuals for example, there was one turkey named Kaylee, because she liked to eat kale, who was taken by animal control. There was somebody else in the community who raised turkeys for slaughter. Two of his turkeys were taken by animal control. When he came to reclaim his two turkeys, animal control gave uh, that guy all three turkeys, and all three turkeys were later dead. So we have an ongoing lawsuit right now where we're alleging that the government came in and took the animals without probable cause in violation of my client's rights. Several of the animals died. Several of the animals, we don't know what happened to them. None of this would have happened if 
animal control actually had justified, had legal justification to take the animals. And there are other side issues, such as the whole reason why they targeted her, because she is an outspoken member of the community. She criticizes animal control's actions and behaviors routinely. And we allege that this, this raid that, that they took was in retaliation of her speaking out against them. The other group of cases I have involves animal rights activists and vegans who want to uh, uh, protest and demonstrate and speak in favor of animal rights and speak in favor of veganism. In California, we have very, uh, we have great laws that respect uh, the, the First Amendment right to protest. Not only do we have the, the federal First Amendment right, but the California Constitution also has the free speaking right. And we have a num number of other rights that give people the right to protest. And so in each of these other cases, my clients had gone to areas where they should be able to protest, they should be able to demonstrate, and yet they were ordered by police under threat of arrest not to. Uh, for example, we had a protest, my clients had a protest in front of the Staples Center, where several other people were also expressing themselves. There was the Free Hong Kong movement, and they were telling people to support democracy in Hong Kong. They were handing out t-shirts that said Free Hong Kong on it. Uh, there were other people who were there for what we call commercial free speech. So there were some acrobats who were called the, the dream team or the damn team, I don't recall which. And so this is commercial free speech. They were left alone by the police. The free Hong Kong people were left alone by the police. But my clients, the animal rights activists, they had uh, television monitors mounted to their chest in a, what's called a cube of truth. And in the cube of truth, you have four people standing in a square, each facing outward with a, chest tele with a chest mounted television. And in this case, the video that was playing on these television sets were of uh, abuse to horses and horse races. There were horses being whipped by jockeys. There were horses in their stalls who were panicked and upset. And there were images of horses with broken legs. Apparently what happened was some people in the crowd were upset with what they saw. There was one complaint where a mother said that she didn't want her child to see these images, and so police targeted my clients and told my clients they had to leave because of the content, because of the images that were being shown. There is exhaustive precedent that the government is not allowed to regulate the content of your message except for a very narrow range of things, such as if there's fighting words, such as if there's plagiarism. There's very few things that the government can regulate. Preventing people from seeing this on television screen is not one of the things the government can regulate as easily as a lot of these images, for example, were shown on television, on broadcast television, of jockeys whipping horses. If they can show it on broadcast television, how could it be something so absurd, something so dangerous to show here outside of the Staples Center? Uh, it, it just goes along the line that in order for the content of your speech to be regulated by the government, it has to be something that is inherently dangerous for the public or dangerous for someone, such as if you are rallying people to a mob, to a, to a riot-like status. Those types of words can be, can be regulated. How many different kind of cases, uh, vegan-related cases or activism-related cases, have you have you uh, taken on in all, approximately? At the present time, I've been an attorney for a little over 10 years. I would estimate 40 to 50 cases have been for animal rights or for vegans. Some of these cases are not specifically related to veganism, but it would be for a vegan who needs legal help. So for example, uh, I haven't had any bankruptcy cases, but if a vegan was, needed to file for bankruptcy, or if a vegan needed to file for divorce, or some of these other cases, the, the case itself wasn't veganism, but it was for a vegan client. Yeah, but in relation to activism, approximately how many? It's hard to estimate, at least 30, 35, 40, maybe more, in 10 years. A lot of times in the work, it's like against policy and, and I guess against the law even, like to say things like sexually toward other employees, you know, and, um, or racist or anything, that could create a hostile working environment. But sometimes vegans find themselves 
in a hostile work environment because they're so different, you know, and people might make fun of them. Do you think there's ever a chance, you know, a vegan can be protected in the workplace in the same way? Yeah, definitely. The, the laws on the books right now will protect anyone who is bullied or harassed uh, at their work environment. I had one client who was soft-spoken about veganism at work, didn't preach, but if people asked about it, that client would talk. One of the employees anonymously printed off uh, uh, an article about why people should be eating meat and put that article in that employee's box. And it was, it was viewed as harassment, just this anonymous letter showing up in the box. So uh, working with that client, the client talked to their supervisor, their supervisor talked to information technology they were able to identify the employee who had done that, and that employee was given a, a reprimand for doing that. So that didn't escalate to a lawsuit. But that's the idea, is that everybody at work should have a reasonably comfortable work environment. When it gets to the, to the level of harassment and bullying, then there could be legal action. Not every, um, uh, every time we're bothered should we file a lawsuit, but certainly if that had not been remedied by the company, or if that behavior had continued, then there could have been a lawsuit. Was there anything else that we didn't cover in our interview that you think would be cool to throw out there? Well, we had discussed in the interview why we should care about others. It makes sense that we take care of ourselves, we defend ourselves, we protect ourselves. It makes sense that we protect our family. It makes sense that we protect our community. And we have these layers and layers of how we relate to other people. We relate to other people by religion, by brand of clothes. We have these tribes. The whole idea of veganism, the whole idea of animal rights, and the reason why we should care about others, is that ultimately all of these layers of tribalism, they're arbitrary. So what might matter to me as uh, protecting members of all species someone else might want to protect somebody of their own skin color, somebody else might want to protect somebody of their own country, and somebody might want to protect others of their own political party. All of these divisions are arbitrary unless you're protecting everybody. And the everybody that makes sense here, that makes a moral sense here, that really matters, is everybody who is sentient, everyone who can suffer, everyone who can feel pain, so the idea of animal rights is that if, you, if you're a member of the sentient class, sentient loosely meaning you can sense, you can feel, you have thoughts and feelings, everybody who can feel deserves not to feel pain, deserves not to suffer, at least uh, to have it intentionally inflicted on them. And so when we, when we divide groups up into us versus them, and we are willing to target them and make them feel pain and make them suffer, that is what is morally wrong. It doesn't matter what their species is. It doesn't matter if they are human, if they are nearly human. Uh, it, their genetic composition is not relevant. And I would further that point to say that the whole idea of a genetic composition being the way to measure if somebody deserves protection of course, by its very nature, that's racism, and we reject racism. It doesn't matter what somebody's genes are, it doesn't matter what they look like, it doesn't matter if somebody has too many, uh, uh, too many chromosomes, which would be the case of Down syndrome. It doesn't matter if somebody has red hair, because red hair, freckles, that is a specific gene that manages that. And so if their genes are not human genes, it matters not. If their genes are not white genes, it matters not. What matters is that they can suffer, they can feel pain. It doesn't matter how close they are to us, it doesn't matter how far they are to us, what matters is can they suffer.